this is normal, Janine. Welcome to Books and Banter, formerly known as Between the Lines, a podcast about books. I'm Janine, a library clerk. And I'm Jess, a branch admin. And we both work at the Winkler branch of South Central Regional Library. In this podcast, we talk about books with our own twist. We read the first half of the book and predict where it might be going, and then finish reading the book and discuss the second half. There will be snark, there will be spoilers, and depending on the book, there may be references to violence, sex, and other adult topics. So if that's not for you, stop listening now. All right, let's get into this week's book. All right, so today we are reading Christmas Presents by Elisa Unger. It's her new novella. Madeline Martin has built a life for herself as the young owner of a thriving business, the Next Chapter Bookshop, despite her tragic childhood and now needing to care for her infirm father. When Harley Granger, a failed novelist turned true crime podcaster, drifts into her shop in the days before Christmas, he seems intent on digging up events that Madeline would much rather forget. She's the only surviving victim of Evan Handy, the man who was convicted of murdering her best friend, Steph, and is suspected in the disappearance of two sisters, also good friends of Madeline's, who have been missing for nearly a decade. It's an investigation that has obsessed her father, Sheriff James Martin, right up until his stroke took his faculties. Harley Granger has a gift for seeing things that others miss. He wasn't much of a novelist, but his work as a true crime author and podcaster has earned him fame and wealth and some serious criticism for his various unethical practices. Still, visiting Little Valley to be closer to his dying father has caused him to look into a case that many people think is closed, and some want reopened. And he has a lot of questions about the night Stephanie Kramer was killed, Ainsley and Sam Wallace disappeared, and Madeline Martin was left for dead, bleeding out on a riverbank. Since Evan Handy went to jail, three other young women have gone missing, most recently a young college dropout named Lolly, Five young women missing in the same area in a decade. Are they connected? Was Evan Handy innocent after all? Or was there someone else there that night? Someone who was still satisfying his dark appetites. As Christmas approaches and a blizzard bears down, Madeline and her childhood friend Badger return to a past they both hoped was dead, to find the missing lolly and to answer questions that have haunted them both, discovering that the truth is more terrible and much closer to home than they think. Coupling a picturesque, cozy setting with a deeply unsettling, suspenseful plot, Christmas Presents is a chilling seasonal novella that can be enjoyed all year long. So this book was published October 24th, 2023, and is a standalone as far as we know. One quote, if you're looking for a warm, heartwarming story of holiday cheer, this ain't it. This book is a cold-blooded, nasty thriller. I loved it. R.L. Stein. So a little bit about the author Lisa Unger. Her novels have sold more than 2 million copies and have been translated into 26 languages. When asked, can you tell us a two-sentence horror story, she replied, I chased her over the crackling frozen lake and into the black winter forest, heart revving with effort, frigid air biting my skin. When I reach her, my hand closing over her pale dead wrist, the wind blowing her hair around her like dull fire, she slowly turns and the face I see is my own. In a Wall Street Journal article from 2015, Unger says, some people are adrenaline junkies, I am a comfort junkie. And that resonated with me a lot. (laughs) So there you have it. Let's get into it. First of all, let's talk about the cover. It's (laughs) fine. It makes me want a lake house. (laughs) Like to me, it looks kind of cozy and festive, but also very much towing the line between festive and like, yeah, somebody dies in this. Sinister. (laughs) Yep. Yeah, festive and sinister, I think, at the same time. And she, does, she doesn't She does do one of the things that irks me the most with authors, especially big-name authors, mm-hmm. where it's like, James Patterson! A life of true crime. Like, where, <laughs> <laughs> where their name is huge and the title is little. Yeah, where it's like, what, wait, what is actually the title of this mm-hmm. book? Hers is, the font is basically the same it's size, the same. so she yeah. gets a pass. Yeah, and it's easy to tell, like, what is the name and what is the title. Yeah, exactly. Here. And so... Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice cover. Honestly, stylistically, I don't have any criticisms of it. It's It hits that line in between festive and murdery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, it looks nice and cozy, but also like an abandoned house in the middle of nowhere that you wouldn't want to end up in by yourself. Are you kidding me? I'm looking up the property prices of that house. <laughs> well, I mean... I will, I will fix it up. DIY is fine by me. <laughs> I mean, in the wrong circumstances, you don't want to end up in this house. I wouldn't want to be chased into this house. Yeah. Or held captive here. Yet. 
have you read Lisa Unger before? I don't think I have. I know the author's familiar to me. I know she's quite popular, but mm-hmm. I don't recall unless it was in my much younger days. <laughs> I recently read one um, like a month or so ago. It was one of her newer ones, Secluded Cabins, Cabin Sleep Six, I think is what it's called. Mm. I didn't love it. Cabin's a theme, is it? I think so. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I didn't I didn't love that one. It was okay. But yeah, so we'll see about this one. I uh, It's only a novella, so I feel like there's so much I want to know already. How are they going to pack that all into the second half? Yeah, I mean, that being said, like, it doesn't feel like some novellas where they feel very thin. Yeah. Like, she's got enough packed in there that I'm like, okay, no, you you have my interest. Yeah. Well, I thought it's it started not, off kind of like, slow, but... A little bit on the slow side, but not more in the building the setting because it is very much like the small town is practically a character in itself mm-hmm. and the expectations of a small town everything's safe everybody knows everybody mm-hmm. like it, it's a little bit slow in that regard but also it's not painful to read like some yeah <laughs> like there's some where it's just like oh kill me yep i just i think the part i really am looking forward to is when harley goes to talk to evan handy yeah um I really want to read or hear, like, see that conversation. I think see it's we... going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't like Harley. No, not at all. I think he is unethical. Yep. And he is the epitome of all the problems I have with true crime. <laughs> yep. Like, recording people without telling you mm-hmm. you're recording them. Like, come on. I am yeah. very big on privacy and... You have to be upfront with the people that you are off the record is my motto Mm -hmm. like yeah i'm getting angry for the characters already like chet (laughs) who was just before the halfway point where he was interviewing him with his phone in his pocket i'm like oh you don't you dare young man i know (laughs) young man (laughs) you realize he's probably older than you yeah i'm well aware of that (laughs) yeah i mean i will say at one point they're like oh they died in like the summer of 2013 and i'm like okay i'm old now (laughs) because they're talking about like a 10 year old mystery i'm like <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's I had a kid already in 2013, so literally they're pretty much the same. The characters are the same age as me. Where I'm like, great. <laughs> <laughs> You're not old. I just feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> also, every time they said Evan Handy, all I could think was Evan Hansen from Dear Evan Hansen. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. The book and also a Broadway musical and a movie. So that's all. It's too close. The name is too close. I'm not going to tell you what uh, his name reminded me of. Okay, then. (laughs) It's... No. This let's not go there. (laughs) Do you think that Evan Handy is the murderer? Quite honestly, at this point, I'm leaning towards Badger being the murderer. I was going to say Chet. Yeah. Because at one point, um, when it was... Lolly was getting disappeared. Mm -hmm. she, uh, She talked about smelling weed. And they keep talking about how Chet is a... A stoner. A stoner. Yeah. But I also thought Badger, when they were the last... I think it was the last chapter when they were in the bookstore. Mm-hmm. And she said he looked afraid. Well, the, like, flashback... I don't know, flashback, memory, dream, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um, where she couldn't... In some of her memories, it was Badger. Yeah. That was doing the stabbing. Right. In some of them, it wasn't. <laughs> You're writing down my prediction. Yeah, I Badger. Am. <laughs> so that we remember for yeah. next time. We can see if we're right. Like, it could be Chet. He's got the long, mysterious disappearances where he just doesn't, mm-hmm. like, doesn't show. So he's got plenty of, like, gaps in his alibi. Badger just gives me that, like, mm, he's <laughs> got secrets. Yeah. I feel like everybody in this book has secrets. Yeah, that's what makes it a good mystery book. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that the term Christmas presents actually refers to the Christmas presents that she's actually getting. Mm -hmm. Because since Evan's been locked up, she's been getting Christmas presents every year. Yep. I don't think they're from Evan. No, I don't think so. And that's also why I don't think that Evan is the murderer. I think he may have seen something. I may think... I know he's involved in some way because you don't keep your mouth shut Mm -hmm. and go, oh yeah, no, it's me. I'm the serial killer. Without somebody having something on you Mm -hmm. or there being some very good reason right but there's also the issue of the girls no before before he moved to this town he had an issue at his school with a girl Mm -hmm. apparently 
But to be fair, he did also explain that, not saying I'm believing him, but he yeah. did explain, like, yeah, she's just... No, I know. He broke up and she turned crazy. He had a he had a reason, a very good reason. But, I mean, we, we've all seen that happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the ex just goes, whoa, crazy. <laughs> yep. Like, it's conceivable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got a lot of questions, honestly. I know, right? <laughs> Me too. It's... And that's what I... I feel like how can we be halfway through already because there is a I feel like still a lot a lot of questions well like Loli being kidnapped <laughs> and the guy wearing a Santa mask I'm like mm-hmm. dude really and that part I was like come on man it, it's a bit too on the nose mm-hmm. agreed I do hope Loli gets out of it mm-hmm. because the one thing that really annoyed me about Holly like the Stephen King book that we did was the fact that it was so close to one of the victims Mm -hmm. escaping like within a couple of hours and that just still makes me a little bit mad Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i'm hoping lolly either like gets out preferably or is dead and gone long before so there's not that just mm, missed it by that much yep i agree so getting out would be preferable definitely but uh yeah and presumably the friends who are missing the sisters are also dead i believe they're not just hiding out somewhere and gonna return yeah that's the thing too like there's two missing one dead one left for dead the two missing is the thing that kind of throws everything off Mm -hmm. because they could be involved oh i never thought of that like huh they're missing yes they could be victims Mm -hmm. they could also be part of it interesting theory Mm-hmm. I trust no one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was reading a different book last night. It was a cozy mystery, and I was like, oh, is it that person? Is it that person? Surely she can't trust that person. <laughs> like, everybody is a suspect. Honestly, in this kind of books, yeah, everybody is yeah. a suspect. The only people that I kind of trust are, like, her two bookstore workers. <laughs> I'm like, they're probably fine. Yeah. Um, not even the nurse, honestly. No? The nurse taking care of her dead. I get the feeling she knows something. Hmm. I don't know if she was involved, but perhaps she does know something. Like, I wouldn't I wouldn't go so far as to say involved. I don't think she's like, oh, no, no, a little bit harder. That'll cut off the blood flow. But I would not be at all surprised, given the fact she's a lifelong resident of the town, if she doesn't know something, maybe about, like, Evan's mom or mm-hmm. the history or something somewhere. Yeah. Like, she's very close with them. And you don't have that kind of a character that's that close unless there's some kind of purpose to it. So, I also... It's frustrating because I feel like the dad keeps trying to tell her something. Like, he has figured something out or knows mm-hmm. something. And obviously he can't communicate anymore. And it's well, very, like... That's the thing. What is he trying to tell her? I think there's a pretty strong case for Chet or Badger being the one that is the murderer. Mm-hmm. Because... Who found the father and noticed signs of a stroke? It was Chet. Right. Did he find him? Or did he try and kill him? Oh, like maybe he figured it out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. Because she did say at one point that in the months leading up to the stroke, he was sure he was getting close to something. Mm-hmm. And then Chet happens to be there when he happens to have a stroke. Interesting. I mean, my spidey senses are going, <laughs> No. <laughs> See, I know. And the other thing about Chet is that he wasn't supposed to be at the party. And he, no. like, snuck in. Mm-hmm. I mean, a house party. House party, house party. Unless you have security there, anybody can show <laughs> up, right? Like Most don't. <laughs> no. So I, that's kind of why I was like, uh, and Badger maybe knows. See, that's the thing. Or suspects. There's something, there's something not right with Badger. Mm-hmm. Now, is it that he suspected his brother and that's how he found her on the riverbank? Because that's the thing, too. Why was he on the riverbank? Mm-hmm. Like, go fishing a lot? So, yeah. And also, like, obviously we know one is dead, one was left for dead, two are missing. Happened by the river. What were they doing? That's the thing. Like, what circumstances led to this event? How did this... Like, it, they've never really like, said, right? December 23rd. Yeah. In, was it Michigan or something like that? Uh, I don't know. It's cold anyway. Yeah. That's not exactly, like, prime teenagers hang up by a river drink beer time. No. Like, 
what are they doing at the river to begin with? Yeah. Like, there's not, there hasn't been, aside from, like, the results of this crime, there hasn't been a lot of details on what actually led to the crime and how it all played out and everything. So... My grand theory at the moment, and feel free to blow it out of the water with the second half, because that means there's twists, and I like that. (laughs) My theory is Chet is the murderer. Badger knows and suspected, which is how he found Madeline on the riverbank. Chet has... Who's the other two? Ainsley and Sam? Yep. Yep. Um, He has Ainsley and Sam somewhere kept captive. Still alive? Still alive. That's my suspicion. Okay. And Evan saw something, and Chet told Evan that if he didn't take the fall for it, he's going to murder Ainsley and Sam. That's my theory. Hmm. Halfway through. Okay. We are going to see how wrong I am. Not <laughs> normally very wrong about this. That's okay. my theory. I'm writing this down so we remember. <laughs> because Ainsley and Sam's deaths are the only thing that I can think of off the top of my head that is enough leverage to keep Evan in prison. Mm-hmm. And not screeching that he's innocent. Evan, by the sounds of it, hasn't actually mounted much of a defense for himself. Yeah, I, like that's the other thing we don't know. They haven't talked about the trial or any of that. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I keep making noise. <laughs> and Evil Santa says said something to Lolly in terms in long lines of like, "If you're good, I won't kill you, and if you're a good girl, you'll be safe." Kind right. of thing. Which makes me wonder if Ainsley and Sam if they're, if were good. Are all the missing girls still alive? I don't think they all are. Okay. Um, but if it's Chet, Ainsley and Sam know him. Mm-hmm. Unless he's been wearing Santa mask the entire time, and even then, like... That's weird, though. It's not normal. No. <laughs> not if this is normal, Janine. If this was normal, people doing their taxes, we wouldn't be reading it. <laughs> but, like, yeah. I don't know. That's yeah. my theory. Okay. I recorded your theory. We're going to circle back to this in I the really next half. I really hope I'm wrong. I mean, it's not a bad theory, though. That's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head that puts all the pieces together. Yeah. Well, my other thought was, at first I was like, oh, maybe it's Harley Granger who's the murderer. Because he's from the area. Like, he's not from their town. Yeah, but, he, but he's, he's somewhat local because he's from the area, in right? And so... Shady Oaks Rest Home or whatever it's called. He also, to me, seems a little sketchy. So that was my first thought. And then when she talked about smelling weed, I was like, oh, it's Chet. It's got to be Chet. I mean, he's sketchy, but he strikes me more as the sketchy and the I will do unethical things to further myself. Yeah, Kind of sketchy rather than the, like, I'll murder somebody. Yeah. I just hope Madeline doesn't fall for him. I hope so. The guy's a piece of work. Yeah. (laughs) You wanted to say something else. Yes. I have problems with a lot of true crime podcasts. Yeah. Because... Oftentimes, there's a lot of like, woohoo, you know, <laughs> ding dong, the witch is dead kind of thing. <laughs> and the focus is on the murderer, not the victims, mm-hmm. which I get is why we're listening to it. If they weren't victims, we yeah. wouldn't know them from a hole in the ground. But there are times when it, some of them veer very much into disrespecting the victims, mm-hmm. where no. And yeah. there's the whole profiteering off the misery and suffering of others. Mm-hmm. Which yeah is also not a huge fan, but at the same time, if you look big picture, the more we know about psychopaths, sociopaths, serial killers, that kind of thing, the more you can recognize the signs, especially as individual people, not as a system. Yeah, where you can go, oh, my child killing cats. <laughs> Maybe we should take him to a psychiatrist. Yeah, like I think there is some benefit in that regard but at the same time that doesn't lessen the suffering for the individuals actually involved right i know um one of the first true crime podcasts i listen to like regularly is a true crime comedy podcast Mm. and they i don't know if they still do but they got a lot of flack for that because people thought they were making light of these serious crimes and their reasoning is always like this is very serious but we're not making light of the crimes. We acknowledge that this is serious. We acknowledge that, you know, people have suffered and whatever. But this is our way of dealing with with all of that. Like, mm-hmm. it's so heavy that we just need to make a joke. Yeah. To, like, as, it's like a coping mechanism almost. Yeah. It's sort of in the same way uh, Jojo Rabbit, the movie where Tika that guy, mm-hmm. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his name on a Monday, <laughs> um, plays Hitler. And... One of the conversations around when that movie was released was, are you minimizing the suffering 
that he caused. I was like, no, he's acknowledging that there's a lot of suffering, but at the same time trying to show it from the point of view of a child that would be growing up in that time. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, someone like Hitler, if you sat him down and made him watch Jojo Rabbit, he would combust in fury. <laughs> like, yeah, being played by someone of color, being mocked so openly, having his entire philosophy being ripped to shreds mm -hmm. would drive him crazy. So that mocking can be... Humor can be used to help cope with difficult situations. Mm -hmm. And, I don't know, it's, it's a fine line between... It's like comedy. You can say horrible things as a comedian, mm -hmm. and that will sometimes open up the conversation for deeper conversations and right. addressing problems and that kind of thing. Also, I think some of those emotions are so close. Like, mm -hmm. I know sometimes, uh, like, when my dad gets hurt, he laughs instead of, like... There's a fine line between hysteria and hilarity. Yes. And so, like, he hurts himself, and then his reaction is to laugh. Sometimes if I'm laughing... I can feel that there are tears in my eye, like not like not like people who cry when they laugh, mm -hmm. but like I could go from laughing into sobbing in like a second because those emotions for me are very close, right? And there's often the if you don't laugh you'll cry. Yeah. And and I just that comes up in true crime. <laughs> I think too, like it is. It's horrible and not um downplaying that, but also realizing that you have to cope with that in some way, right? And you have That's to, you still have to live in this world and knowing that all of that horrible stuff is out there, like it would be very easy. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts as I know you do as well. It would be very easy to just hear all of that and just sit at home, like hiding mm -hmm. because you're afraid of what might happen if you go outside. But you, at some point you have to deal with that. You have to cope with that. And I think that laughter, like making a joke oh. is... Oftentimes mocking the the perpetrators of the crimes as well. Yeah. That's the thing. Don't mock the victims. No. Uh, there's That's never bad. an acceptable situation for that. No. Um, but mocking some of the <laughs> sociopaths. Mm -hmm. I've also listened to some true crime podcasts where there's a lot of anger towards the perpetrators and mm -hmm. like name calling towards them. You're swearing at this guy because he... Can you not make your anger more productive? Yeah. I enjoy true crime from very much like the psychological perspective, mm -hmm. and one of my favorite true crime podcasts, The Casual Criminalist, which I've mentioned about 15 times, <laughs> <laughs> they will often, like, there's some episodes that they do where, like, they do not give, like, they will not even name the perpetrator of their crime, because oh, okay. they do not want to validate what they've done mm -hmm. by giving them a voice or a name. Yeah. And that, I'm like, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. That, that I, that I respect. There's been a couple where they've just done like uh, the abduction of Kara Robinson I think is one of them where the victim actually went on to work with women in self-defense and became like an investigator and everything and the focus was on that rather than mm -hmm. on whoever the guy was mm -hmm. <laughs> that did the crime to begin with yeah I think there is a tasteful and correct way to handle true crime is it going to be one formula fits all? No. no. Because there's a myriad of true crime mm -hmm. across various levels of horrendousness. Yep. And it's worth saying as well that true crime does not necessarily mean murder. No, that's also true. <laughs> like, there's a there's lot. It's a huge scope of... Thievery, there's fraud, there's mm -hmm. like... Uh, there's a million crimes out there you can commit. But the murder ones are the most interesting. <laughs> the murder <laughs> well, ones are what people think of when they think of yeah. true crime. I forget where I was going with this. <laughs> Anyway, um, my point is, uh, some of the podcasts feel a little bit like they're victim shaming mm -hmm. or going, oh, why did you do that? Why did you go in there? You know, you're like yeah. yelling at a super character in a horror movie mm -hmm. where I am not comfortable with that. No. I think there's something to be learned from true crime. Mm -hmm. I think as a woman, get self-defense classes. <laughs> carry mace, carry a knife, carry something. Learn how to defend yourself. Be aware. Be aware of your surroundings. One yep. of the things that I will never... The, the thing that gets me the most is people that walk in the dark with headphones in. What are you doing? Yes. <laughs> you have no situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Stop. I know. Sometimes I feel uncomfortable walking in the daytime with headphones in. I don't like walking anytime with headphones in. <laughs> I do not like not being able to hear what's behind me, what's around me. I yeah. can't do it. Like, I mean... 
where we live, I'm not overly concerned, but you but just never know. But this is also a small town. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. You never know, right? It's so. that lulling into a false sense of security. Mm-hmm. A small town does not mean a safe town. Yeah. And even what you perceive as a safe town does not mean there is zero crime yeah. or zero violent crime. Yeah, that's true. And crime doesn't necessarily have to be murder either, right? Like It only takes one. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, when I was working on this before we recorded the researching and whatever um true crime is like blowing up Mm -hmm. in the world like it's probably i don't know like there's how many hundreds of true crime podcasts and books and like everybody's writing a book about true crime now it seems like and so um this will come up later in the fun facts but like it was just interesting to see like why we're so obsessed with true crime all of a sudden and yeah that's the thing yeah. too. I think as true crime becomes more prevalent, and you have, like you said, a billion true crime podcasts and there's true crime books coming out every day, there's a lot more pressure to have a hook, to have a catch, mm-hmm. to have something, some kind of gotcha. Yep. That can mean that it's not handled in the most sensitive and appropriate ways. Right. And I think that's one thing to kind of watch out for a yeah. little bit because there's been a couple where i'm like i'm not listening to this podcast anymore because i don't like the way you guys handle things yeah yeah and i'm not saying that a podcast <laughs> i mean casual criminals can go a little bit far sometimes um but <laughs> there is generally more of a they get it right more often than they get it wrong but it's yeah definitely. it's a difficult topic to handle it honestly, is and kudos to the people that can do it mm-hmm. and do it well and the ones that can do their own research and actually do deep dives into this because oh my word yeah no it's true it's uh we've kind of deviated away from the actual book itself (laughs) so yeah it's interesting to read this from the perspective of the true crime writer slash podcaster Mm -hmm. as well and that's the thing too with that guy i kind of feel like he will cut things and edit things together in such a way to make it appear... It's very clickbaity, mm-hmm. put it that way. Like, he said something at one point about it feels like every thought has to be shared with the world. I'm like, no, it doesn't. No. It literally doesn't. Don't do that. That's no. very annoying. It really does not. Granted, I don't like social media as a general concept. <laughs> so maybe I'm a bit more eh, about it than other people. But I don't mind it, but people take it too far. Well, it's like the lifestyle blogs mm-hmm. and stuff. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. You live your life. I'll live my life. Your life looks fake anyway. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like... It's that constant pressure to create content yeah. that I think is par, probably at the root of some of his more unethical practices. Yeah. And I don't trust him as an investigator. No. I don't trust him as a person. Like, I think if he came out and went, oh, Evan Handy's innocent, Chet is, you know, the, the bad guy, whatever, I wouldn't trust that because he seems like the type to do absolutely anything to get that gold sticker that says he solved the case. Yeah. Irregardless of whether or not he did and has actually gotten the right information. Yeah. Or how many people he's heard along the way. I'm also curious to see what's in uh, Madeline's dad's murder room. Yeah. See, Badger asking about that, too, kind of made me go, hmm. Yeah. Well, he had to have known, though. He had to have known, but it sounded very much like, can I see it? Hmm. What does he have in there? Yeah. What's he got on me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And we don't know how, like, publicly accessible the murder room <laughs> was either. <laughs> Sounds horrible. <laughs> well, like, was it just her dad and he, she didn't, he didn't really let anybody else in there? Was it kind of just family or was it like, oh, yeah, no, sure, come on in, Bob. Grab a beer, we'll stare at the murder board. <laughs> connect the red strings. <laughs> like, uh, it, it's yes. kind of one of those things where, like, <laughs> is she going to go into this dusty room and just, like, a giant sticker saying it was chet yeah like i know i'm curious well, and has she poked around the murder room at all it didn't sound like it it sounded like since his stroke it had been closed up yeah so unless she poked around in it before that but that's the thing. it didn't he, sound like it though it sounded very much like he kind of kept it to himself a bit yeah and to be fair like it's a very traumatic thing for her mm-hmm. she does not have her memories all from the time it's flashes of this flashes of that yeah and 
But also the fact that her dad was allowed to stay on the case to me seems kind of like... Mm, it's very small town police force. I know, but still, that's your daughter, mm -hmm. right? You're going to go into that with a bias. Yes. Regardless. And so maybe and see, you just don't take the lead on the case. That's why it surprised me a little bit that his theory was that Evan didn't act alone. Mm -hmm. Because... He didn't like I would have thought for sure that given the opportunity to pin it on Evan, mm -hmm. you know, the motorcycle bad boy that he really doesn't like, yep. he'd just go for that. Yeah. Because, I mean... I told you to stay away bias. from my daughter. You didn't. And now somebody is dead and two girls are missing and my daughter's almost dead. Yeah. Right? Like... The fact that he actually had... <laughs> he could separate things enough to go, like, this doesn't seem quite right. Seems like there's somebody else involved. Mm -hmm. Especially, like, he himself saying that the timeline for Evan didn't match up yeah. with the events. Yeah, I know. It's a lot of questions. Yes. A lot, a lot, a lot. And for all my predictions of it was Chet and yada yada, I kind of hope that I'm wrong because I really hate it when, like, halfway through you're like, oh, yeah, no, this is what happened. And, you yeah, know, you get to the end of the book and that is what happened. Like, Yeah. I want a twist. It's got to be a twist. <laughs> I want to be wrong. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's the, the long disappearances of Chet. That's the most suspicious part. Mm hmm Because that's... It, it's a little bit more than stoners going to be stoners. <laughs> stoners going to stone? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's suspicious. Yeah. So. There's a lot of suspicious people. Mm hmm What do you think of this as a Christmas book? Is it giving you the warm, fuzzy holiday feeling? Mm hmm when they talk about her store and all the Christmas shopping and the snow and whatever, like when they refer to Christmas, yes. It reminds me that I bought six books for Christmas and I'm looking at a couple more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't like... I for, To me, I'm not a Christmas person. I'm the Grinch himself. And this to me hits the right balance between like it's Christmas, but it's not like ramming, you know, mistletoe down your throat mm -hmm. and the dumping hot uh, eggnog down to, you know, wash it down. Like, because there's some that are, like, offensively Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> offensively Christmas? That's a thing. That's a thing. Uh-huh. It's when you have Christmas decorations up in August. Yeah. It's like, honey, nope. <laughs> when your six-year-old wants to put up your Christmas decorations when the first snow happens, which is before Halloween. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. I refuse before Remembrance Day, nothing goes up. Yep. Period. Agreed. Great so. Cup Sunday is usually when ours go up. When is that? I don't do football. <laughs> well, it's actually on Sunday oh. coming up, so we'll see. I told the kids the house has to get cleaned up first, so. Yeah, no, that's key. <laughs> do you have any predictions, or have I? Um, I, I believe that it's Chet and Badger knows. I don't have a very involved... Uh, theory like you do. You don't have my grand sweeping. All yeah. the characters are accounted for. While we were talking though, I was starting to wonder, is it the dad? The sheriff? And then I was like, no, it can't nah. be. But I'm just I'm always suspicious of everybody. I think if it was the dad, Evan would be dead. Mmm. Yes. <laughs> like, true, true, true. Like, I don't I don't think Yeah, no, you're if right. If he's gonna go so far as to kill somebody, it would be Evan. It's not gonna be the friends who are yeah. seemingly innocent in all this. No, you're right. It's definitely the guy on the motorcycle taking his daughter away. Like, yeah, yeah. no question even. No, you're right about that. That is true. And then Evan has absolutely no reason not to go. Oh, it was the sheriff, that guy over there, <laughs> the one who's not happy with me being around his daughter. Definitely him. Yeah, right. No, I know. I just get suspicious of everybody if they do something that's even a little bit questionable. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. So, um, yeah. And I think Madeline's hiding something, but I don't know what it is. I think Madeline is hiding something, but I think Madeline might also be hiding something from herself. Mm. Uh, I don't know that there's been any indication that she's gone to therapy. Mm. I don't know if there has or not. I forget. We read too many books at one time. I know. If she hasn't gone to therapy, she definitely should go to therapy. Uh -huh. <laughs> because it feels like it might be more along the lines of repressed memories yep. rather than intentionally going, I'm protecting anybody. Mm -hmm. Although that being said, she is keeping the Christmas presents from Evan, not Evan, a secret as well. Yeah. But, I mean, wouldn't you if you were getting fan mail? Yeah, I would. Although she did tell Badger now, I think, right? About the presents. Yeah. So. 
So yeah. I still don't buy that it's Evan. The fact that they end up on her front porch. Yeah. They're not sent to the postal system. No, there's no way. Evan has no indication of contacts. Like, he's not in a group or a gang or he's got close friends that would, like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll deliver Christmas presents to your ex-not-girlfriend. Unless his mom's helping him. His mom seems pretty out of it. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she seems a bit more of a wine mom than anything else. So. <laughs> wine mom. Yeah. That's my nice way of saying there's definitely a lot of Xanax and Adderall in that house. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. So. Yep. Yeah. And I can't think of any other characters. See, that's the thing. Uh, Chet pops in. I mean, I hate the name Chet. Like, we're not 1950s here. <laughs> he just Sounds seems like the type to wear loafers and a crew neck. Cereal. Yeah. That too. <laughs> um, I don't think that, like, Chet pops in and out enough that he's on your radar, but not so much that he's, like, in your line of fire in yeah. terms of suspicious characters. Um... For me. I don't think there's anybody else that's kind of close enough. No. Like, I think the nurse knows something, but I don't think she's the one. For me, it was the weed. When Lolly <laughs> said it taught, it smelled like weed. Yeah. Because it's well known that Chet is a stoner, so. Yeah, but that being said, he's not the only stoner in that town, I guarantee it. Oh, no. I'm not <laughs> saying that he is, but uh, he's the only one that's been presented to us. Exactly. Exactly. So, unless that was just a... Uh, red herring? Yeah. If he smelled like red herring, that'd be a trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what red herring smells like? Probably like herring. Herring is a fish? Yes, herring's a fish. <laughs> Sounds like it could also be a bird. There is a Swedish dish. I use the term dish very loosely. <laughs> um, Stromsummer or something along those lines. Murder the pronunciation. Sorry if we have any Swedish viewers. Listeners, very far fetched. Listeners. It is pickled fermented herring. Yee. You open up a can of that stuff, and you can clear it at an apartment building. I think I saw a video of a guy opening that up in his car, and the way he opened it, it somehow got all over his car. And it was like... It's probably just reflex of just, oh, that stinks. I'm going to have to burn this car now. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that tracks. Yeah. So, anyway, enough about herring facts. <laughs> Fun facts about herring. Join us next time for sardine facts. <laughs> the worst part is, like, they're put in their hole, so there's the spines and everything. So, anyways, I think maybe that's the point at which we should wrap it up. Yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, I, I could tie that into, like, were they on the river because they were fishing for herring? <laughs> Is that the red herring of the story? But uh, I don't think they're in the herring fishing grounds. No. They're a sea fish, not river fish. <laughs> All righty. On that note. <laughs> on that note, Linda, you can cut out most of that rambling about herring. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we'll see. I really hope my predictions aren't right. <laughs> we are back with part two of Christmas Presents by Lisa Unger. So, I think we were sort of right with our predictions. Yeah, and I'm a little bit disappointed by the fact we were right. <laughs> I, w I was expecting to be a little bit right. I wasn't expecting to be that right. Yeah. Although you said that Badger knows, and Badger didn't seem to know. No, but Badger caught on pretty quick. He did. Like, but, you get the feeling that he always sort of had a suspicion. But you also said that Chet had Ainsley and Sam captive. and Yeah, I was hoping they'd still be alive. Yeah, they were not. And that Evan, that Chet was the, the instigator of all of the crimes. And Evan, um... <laughs> That's a good way to describe him, actually. <laughs> Evan saw something, and Chet threatened Evan with Ainsley and Sam's life if Evan tells, mm -hmm. is what I have written down. And I think that Sam's murder and Ma Maddie, that's the main character's name. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's so bad. Um, Maddie's injuries were from Evan. Mm -hmm. So, Although there was speculation that perhaps Maddie had killed Sam. Yeah. Which I thought was really interesting. That, I'm like, seriously? That would have surprised me. That would have victim shame. That would have been a good twist ending, though. It would have been, yeah. To be honest, I would have liked that ending better, I think. Her having... The thing is, they kind of teased repressed memories throughout the entire mm -hmm. thing. So it kind of would have actually been better mm. if she had actually killed Sam. Yep. Whether that be accidentally or on purpose. But it would have been, like, rather than just, like, oh, let's speculate about this, that to make that the actual ending, yeah. it would have been a bigger shocker mm -hmm. to me than this kind of felt like... Wah, wah. I was disappointed, honestly. <laughs> yeah. 
like, Chet being the murderer, I'm like, okay, fine. I guess if we have to, it all lines up too neat. Yeah. Well, and the dead giveaway was when he was with, um, that first girl. What was her name? L- L- Lolly? Lolly, yep. And she smelled weed, and they made a big deal about the fact that he mm-hmm. was a pothead. That's the thing. It was pretty, like, whack you over the head with it. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, it was very was in a lot of shock when it was the big reveal was like oh yeah okay sure and i also really felt like the whole harley granger aspect of the story Mm -hmm. could have been completely left out honestly i i'm still a little bit perplexed by why that was even in there i know because a i just don't like him i think he could be removed um without any kind of harm to the book it would not make a single solitary difference he didn't really do anything nope like, he didn't have a part in solving the murder. He got shot. Yay, good job, dude. And they kept talking about how he was going to the prison to talk to Evan. And I was waiting and waiting yeah. and waiting for that conversation. I there'd be some kind of, like, hint or clue or, like, I know. way to tie to... No, no, it just I thought that really would happens. be so interesting. Like, she could have set it up totally differently that he goes to the prison, he talks to Evan. Evan says, oh, actually, it was Maddie. She killed Sam. Yeah. And Sam, all her wounds were from Sam fighting back and me trying to whatever. Or and, even accidentally releasing some kind of detail that he then... Yeah tells maddie when he's interviewing her and she goes oh oh dear i remember this now or like some kind of helps Mm -hmm. no he's useless the total like you could take that entire storyline out of the book wouldn't make a single solitary difference to the actual story i think i might like the story better actually perhaps it's still not like and him and the was his random producer or yeah like whatever Oh, by the way, I love you. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, he does reference her. We like, don't meet her until the till, hospital. Until the very the end of the book. Very end. I know. He talks about her and that they have a budding relationship and whatever, but... Yeah, but it was very much like, eh, yeah, maybe, yeah, no, sure. And then all and of a sudden... And even at the end, if I'm not mistaken, I read this book a week and a half ago, so... Yeah. But if I'm not mistaken, he's like, I... He's very much like, I guess I love you, you'll do for now kind yeah. of Yeah, I'm going to tell you I love you because your what's right in front of me kind of thing which i mean the same could be said for a sandwich yeah <laughs> maybe he also loves his sandwich Very i don't know possible but, sandwiches are good oh i just there was so much potential in this book squandered yes totally i was very disappointed like i was right uh, for a disturbing amount of it i should mm-hmm. not be that right yeah i'm normally horrible at predicting these things and even like the sheriff his heart attack even Chet being there. Stroke. Stroke, sorry. And contributing to it, if mm-hmm. not causing it. I don't want to be that right in any mystery book. Yeah. Ever. I want to be wrong. I want to be 100% wrong. I know. I want you to smack me outside of the left face with a seal for these books. Like, I, I don't want to be right. I love a good surprise ending, mm-hmm. to be honest. And this was none of that. This was a Ferris wheel, not a roller coaster. <laughs> and this was like... So this is the second Lisa Unger book that I've read now. Second one that I didn't really care for. Mm. Was the I, other one kind of flat as well? Yeah, kind of. It was Secluded Cabin Sleep 6. Mm. And it was just... No, I did not care that's for just, it. That just sounds like an ad for, <laughs> you know, an Airbnb. <laughs> well, kind of. They went out to a fancy pants cabin way out in the middle of nowhere. And then there was like a... I don't know if it was a hurricane or some sort of, like, they're in Florida. Mm. So, yeah, some sort of tropical storm or something blew in while they were there. And Is there at least an alligator? There was not what? an alligator. You're in Florida in a secluded cabin in a hurricane, and there's not an alligator? They were, like, more inland than right on the coast, I think. So? I don't know. There was, the Everglades are a thing. There was no... There's gators there. No alligators there was a peeping Tom cabin owner. Did he have an alligator? Oh, Florida man has disappointed me. <laughs> anyway. I'm just saying alligators are such good tools in murder mysteries. Okay. They can threaten. They can chase. Excellent disposal system. The Everglades. I don't even want to guess how many bodies are probably high hidden in there. Yeah, that's true. Like, they're well, very handy creatures to keep around. <laughs> I know this is not an alligator, but... When we were in Australia, we went on a, a crocodile watching cruise, mm. <laughs> and we actually saw a couple. And then I held the baby crocodile um. in my literal hands, <laughs> like this. I have a picture. Do they feel weird? 
Uh, no, it feels like a leather purse kind of thing. <laughs> that's what the lady who... Ha- well, I can imagine you with straps. So. That's what the lady who handed it to me said. She's like, oh, it's just like holding a leather purse. And I was like, oh, yeah. And they put a band around its mouth so they can't, like, yeah, snap yeah. at you or whatever. But, but yeah. I was like, when am I ever going to get a chance to hold a crocodile again? I mean, true, true. You know, like, <laughs> we are way off topic here. <laughs> Clearly, we don't have a lot of things to say about this book because... <sighs> I do have something to say about this book. Okay. Badger's name is Steve... <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> what did you think it was gonna be hopefully not steve well i mean that whole scene i'm just like really i know but then from then on when he said please call me steve the narrator whatever she kept fl- flip-flopping back yeah. and forth between badger and steve and i was like okay pick one then yeah he wants to be called steve call him steve you're the, you literally wrote him saying i want to be called steve stop referring to him as badger yeah as a narrator be nice come on well. use the people's selected names and pronouns come on <laughs> also you chose the character's name exactly you chose that he wanted to be called that now do it i just find it a little bit hilarious he's like oh hey Please call me Steve. <laughs> okay, Steve. <laughs> Steve. What's wrong with the name Steve? What I will say is Chet is pathetic and yeah. a word that I'm not allowed to use in a work <laughs> podcast. Um, Chet told Lolly his name was Steve. Like, really, dude? You're using your brother's name to commit crimes? Yeah. Come on. Well, you know. It, it Honestly, Chet is such a loser like i'm sorry he is pathetic it's just a big knob head with no knob he is pathetic yeah like he's chasing lolly he sees the truck oh dear i'm caught and then he just collapses and i'm like dude seriously run try yeah i know put in a little bit of effort to be a villain i didn't really care for any of the characters in this book yeah like madeline and steve are fine Uh, i don't know they're they're very baseline flat yeah. yeah. There's characters. nothing really interesting about them. They're not great, no. But Chet is pathetic. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. He is unimaginative. Yeah. Like, his whole villainy was coached by Evan. Yeah. He's not even good enough to be his own villain. And also... He's a villain's puppet. To wear a Santa hat at Christmas or Santa mask at Christmas time? Come on, dude. Yeah. It does make me wonder if he does the rest of the year as well. Mm. He bought one mask and he's sticking with it. <laughs> or does he like change ho, ho, ho. it up? Happy There's Easter. a leprechaun one. <laughs> his, his crimes are all holiday related. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a stars and stripes. There's a turkey. <laughs> the holiday I like killer. Think, I like to think that Evan chose everything else about the crimes. And then he's like, but Evan Chet's just like, oh no, I want to pick something. I can't do everything. Fine, you'll pick the mask. <laughs> really goes all out and just picks really themed masks every single time. I really hope that's what happens. Cupid for Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh, I really want that to be true. <laughs> well, we can make it so. Oh, I want the director's cut of this book where it's just Chet mask shopping going, oh yes, is it close enough to Christmas now to swap out the, the turkey for the Santa one? <laughs> Also a Condoleezza Rice one for election day. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. I know why that one. Oh. I feel like that was a popular mask back a few years ago. It seems like it, yeah. I once saw, I think it was on a TV show, it was a Condoleezza Rice mailbox. Oh. And her jaw opened up to put the letters in. Oh, it's oh. funny. Anyways. I want, I really, really want <laughs> the themed masks. That would be funny. I don't disagree. <laughs> That would be that would make the book more interesting for sure. I would be more of a fan then. <laughs> but no, like he's yeah. he's just kind of pathetic. I this whole book was just like he's like he's a villain where I, as as a reader I want to be I don't know scared but I want the villain to make me pause and go ooh wouldn't yeah. want to run into him in a dark alley I could take Chet in a dark alley yeah. He also left, like, food and clothes out for her, which doesn't seem like a villainy thing to do also. And he didn't seem very ritualistic. Yeah. Like, you... I don't want to... Serial killers are varied, obviously. But you tend to have ones that are a bit more like, well, they've got a ritual when it comes to their killings. Mm -hmm. And everything needs to be prepared, and they want things a certain way, that people that fit a certain stereotype, that kind of thing. He didn't have that. No. And that's where you tend to have a lot more of the, like, 
capture and preparation in some ways. Mm-hmm. And then you have, like, the very much, like, stab and grabs. It seemed very willy-nilly. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He's just... He's a bad villain. I mean, even where he's burying them. Yeah. On property know. you have a direct link to. Really? Mm-hmm. You had a lake. But the fact that they couldn't find the bodies either. No, well, they hadn't found them yet. No, I mean, like, in all of those years. Yeah. Like, it was ten years, right, since Ainsley and well, Sam went missing? What got me was... Okay, so Badger and, no, sorry, Steve. 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 <laughs> sorry. sorry to anybody out there named Steve. Something about the name in this book and just being related to Badger just makes me want to mock it so hard. Um, Steve and Chet were both questioned mm-hmm. after the murders. Did seriously nobody put together a link with, with the fact that they own property and that it's quite secluded? Like... I would have thought that that was one of those things where, hey, you're you're a murder suspect. Can we just check it out? Yeah. Especially or, if, like, Chet's whereabouts especially seemed rather... Not unaccounted for, but not necessarily uh, ironclad. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. it honestly doesn't seem like the kind of mystery that needs to take ten years to get to. Mm-mm. Like... No. It was... And, like, they didn't even really do much investigative work. No. They're like, hey, it might be Chet. Let's go check out this property. Oh, look, he happens to be chasing a woman (laughs) down the road wearing a creepy Santa mask. Yeah. Yeah. And let's go through my dad's, all of my dad's hard work. Yeah. Oh, Badger and Chet were both questioned. Like, it's very... Yeah. Like, honestly, I'm a little bit unimpressed with the sheriff. I'm a little bit unimpressed with the book. Yeah. In general. Yeah. It had such good, good start. Uh, And I really... I feel like a lot of Christmas books are romancy, mm-hmm. which I don't mind, but I like a good Death in the Holidays thriller. Yes, right. I love thrillers. That's my favorite genre. So, I, like, there's I feel like they're starting to be more Christmas thrillers, mm-hmm. but a lot. So much of the Christmas books that are out there are like cozy mysteries or romance or Christian fiction, this which is, is fine. Honestly, very close to being cozy mystery. I would I like a cozy mystery better than I liked this. I'm not gonna lie. Like it's got but, that kind of like you can see the plot from a mile away. Yeah, but like I just this one was such a disappointment. I read last year. I read one called The Christmas Murder Game, mm-hmm. which hundred times better than this. And then I also read this another one this year. It was also like a novella, like eighty nine pages or something. And the author said it was meant to be read in one sitting. Oh, it was so terrible. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I was like... It's meant to be read in one sitting, because if you put it down, you were never picking it up It took me three sittings to get through those 89 pages. Oh my word. It was bad. It was... I did... And then I saw some people, like, raving about it. And I was like, really? That? No. Hmm. It was not that good, in my opinion. Anyway, so I just... uh, If you have any good Christmas books that aren't romance, put them in the comments, because I like to read Christmassy books. I don't. But, you know, put them in the comments anyway. (laughs) Okay, last year I read A Boy Called Christmas. I think that's what it's called. That one was really fun. You probably might like that. Isn't that that one a movie now? It's a movie on Netflix. You might like that one because it's actually funny. It's a junior fiction book. See, that I'm more likely to like. Mm -hmm. Because junior fiction ones tend to be anything but adult. Tends to be a lot more like, eh, sure, throw in an element of fantasy. Why not? Yeah. And not that I mind romance occasionally, but so much of Christmas books are... Yeah. And, like, I will say, this one wasn't wasn't really romancy. This one wasn't. It was meant to be a a thriller. Random. It was meant to be a thriller, I think, but uh, I wasn't overly thrilled. No. No, not thrilled at all. Not scared at all. I was bored. (laughs) Like, honestly. I'm sorry. Chet is such a bad villain. (laughs) And all the characters were so flat. They were trying to make Evan scary, but he's already in jail, so bye bye I know. Like, let's get to the part where the podcaster actually talks to him. Yeah. That's the interesting part. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It just... Yeah, I know. Fell flat. This one was a flop for me. Even the fact that it was Badger leaving her the Christmas presents the entire time. Yeah. I'm like, seriously? Yeah. You couldn't have Evan's old cellmate, you know, dropping stuff off? Yeah. No. You had an opportunity there, and no, it was just set up for like, oh, by the way, I I love love you. you. Zero bells. Like, it's... And I'm sorry. Badger... Really? 
he annoys me a little bit as a character. <laughs> because just suddenly his wife's in Florida. Yeah. Oh, by the way, yeah, we broke up. Oh, by the way, I love you. Yeah. By the way, do you want to get together? I've always loved you since high school. Like? And I married somebody else even though I knew I still loved you. Don't do that. No. Like, and I don't totally understand why he married somebody else. Because I'm like, she's not married. She was emotionally unavailable to him. It's not like that changed a whole lot in 10 years. I know. But you could have worked on it rather than marrying a different woman. Well, men do stupid things sometimes. <gasps> no! That is news to me. I have never heard of that before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I don't know. Like, it, it's just one of those, it felt very awkward and shoehorned. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh shoot, I have to do something with Badger now. Quick, mm -hmm. get rid of the wife. It's <laughs> got to be a love interest. Mm-hmm. Because if there's not... It's just kind of... Yeah. I had such hopes for this book in the middle. I know. And now I'm disappointed by it. There was potential. Like, I don't want to be right. <laughs> I like being right, but I don't want to be right in this case. <laughs> Not so right. No. That, I like books uh, like The Pawn, where I'm wrong across the board. <laughs> like, everything is wrong. I like a good twist. That's my kind of book. A nice twisty twist that I didn't see coming. No. It's not ones that I saw coming from a mile away because they're yep. flat and boring. Yep. Sorry to anybody that liked this book. <laughs> <laughs> There's we, better ones out there, I promise. We do not recommend. No. Apologies. If you're looking for a very light Christmas thriller that's not thrilling and not very Christmassy, this is it. Yeah. You found it. Look yeah. no further. But now we also spoiled it for you, so... Uh, yeah, sorry. There's also that. On the bright side, it was spoiled by Chapter 3, so... <laughs> That's true. We did figure it out in the first half, so... Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you have any fun facts first, Janine? Uh, I do. I'm going to read you an article that I found online about true crime podcasts. Because I thought this book had more to do with true crime than it actually did. True crime podcasts, I should say. Yes. It, it, um, didn't he even release a podcast? Like... There was a thing at the end. Yeah, he, he did release a podcast about it, I think. I don't know. I just don't like that guy. I'm sorry. He's scuzzy. Well, like when he's doing the live stream and he organized for one of his friends to like jump out and scare him or whatever. It's like, dude. Yeah. So You're pathetic. And this article is called The True Crime Genre is Popular, but is it ethical? From the University of Oregon, August 28th, 2023. And this book actually did allude to some of these things about the ethics of true crime. Mm -hmm. Which I found very interesting because I know you and I as well are both big listeners of true crime podcasts. So mm -hmm. Now this article is actually based on a course that is taught at a school, I think the University of Oregon, or some school in the States, about the ethics of true crime. Well, I mean, it does the University of Oregon. Yeah. August 28th, 2023. A few thoughts on that. A lot of this article is interesting. Yeah, I think there are times when the citizen sleuth element is... It can be useful. Mm -hmm. Like you said, cold cases. I think in active cases, no. No. Because that just leads to more glorification of the current crime, mm -hmm. more pain and issues for the family members and close people that are involved, especially, like she says, if people close to the victim are painted as the villain mm -hmm. partially because you know some people that you know just aren't likable doesn't yeah. mean they killed you just not exactly. likable they're just not yeah i know but that being said like i said uh, cold cases i think there is a bit more of a mm -hmm. a use for it because yeah. there's something to be said for a different perspective different set of eyes mm -hmm. and you may have had detectives going over this time and time and time and time mm -hmm. and time again or possibly not going into it at all yeah because police corruption's a thing yeah also the whole thing about the white woman mm -hmm. and uh it was interesting i was listening to a podcast that was about natalie holloway who is i think that's her name she was murdered on a class trip to like aruba or something mm -hmm. and her killer was actually just recently caught um but anyways, there was so much focus on her because she was like an 18-year-old, blonde-haired, white girl who had gone missing, probably like from an affluent community, you know. Um, so what this podcast did, while they covered this case, they also talked about a few other cases of similar women who had gone missing at the same time or similar circumstances, but were not white. See, Which I thought was an interesting 
the perspective. Same. Like, let's pull in some of these other cases. You probably never heard of any of these people, mm-hmm. but their cases were very similar to this case. Let's talk about these people too, right? Well, so. that's the thing. Like, she at one point said, let me see if I can find it here. For example, often victims and stories shared are white and female, likely because the target audience is white women and they pref- tend to prefer to listen to cases they can insert themselves into. I would argue with that. I would too. Because I think that's a quite a narrow view of it. Mm-hmm. I think part of the reason why you have the cases that are mainly, you know, white, affluent women is because that is what the media covers. Because mm-hmm. the perceived value of white women from a quote-unquote innocent background is Mm -hmm. going to be covered in the media more. Mm -hmm. There's just more information on it, and it is an easier topic to cover just based on the amount of sources you can pull for that. Mm -hmm. I personally find the cases that I have never heard of more interesting than covering John Wayne Gacy for the 15,000th time. (laughs) There's only so many times I want to hear about Ted Bundy. Yeah. Like... Serial killer in Colombia. Mm. Is he the one that killed all the kids? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, not Pedro Lopez. Oh, uh, okay. Different gentleman. Um, <laughs> gentleman. <laughs> Would we call him a gentleman? Uh, no, but I can't use the words I want to use. <laughs> Get us demonetized if we made any money at all. I never heard of him. Mm-hmm. He killed hundreds of kids. Mm-hmm. I would rather that be covered. Bring some light and shed some light on these people rather than... Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. We should still be covering the white women that go missing. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, no. Not to say that they shouldn't get their attention, but also... But there needs to be equal coverage. Yeah. And, again, with sex workers as well, yeah. there's a reason why they're preyed on. Exactly. Because if I'm a serial killer, that's who I'm targeting yeah. first because I know they're not going to get reported. Mm-hmm. They oftentimes don't have family that you know, is in close touch to notice whether or not they're missing. But not necessarily. It's and quite I, common that they work in an area where police, or mistrust of the police is mm-hmm. quite common. Yeah. The chances that they get reported and that there's reliable information to mm-hmm. go on is pretty slim. Yeah. So they are seen as an easy target because yeah. they are not covered by the media. They are... Like, but they are still somebody's daughter or sister or mother or... Yeah. And Whatever, that's the thing right? I will say I liked about Christmas presents is that they didn't stereotype Lolly. Yeah. Like, yes, she worked. <laughs> she, she was worked, a dancer. She was a dancer in a topless bar, but at some point said that she's not a stripper. And I don't want to get into the semantics of that, but uh, I would just they say dancer. did emphasize, or she did emphasize that, like, she still was in contact with her family. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, she just kind of had a detour. Yep. She wasn't, you know, one of the lost women. Yeah. It's, she was a person. It wasn't stereotyped. Just because she was dancing for a period of time. And the one thing I really liked about it is the fact that she got away in the end. Yeah, I know. That was, (laughs) that was like the one good thing about this book. Mm -hmm. She got away. Because that still bugs me about Holly. The fact that they were so close. Yeah. And nope, just missed it. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, yeah, I mean... This sort of, like, made me rethink, though, some of the true crime. Like, both of the ones that she mentioned, My Favorite Murder and Murder With My Husband, I've listened to both of those. Murder With My Husband, what on earth is that? Are they just, you know, DIY how-to guides? No. She is a, like, she's into true crime and he's not. And so she's telling him all these true crime stories. Mm. Because, yeah. Um, Because that's her thing, but it's, he doesn't like it at all. So she forces him to, to listen. They have, like, I think they must have over 100 episodes already. I think they have quite a few. Um, my favorite murder, I feel like they, I feel like they try to think about things from, like, the victim standpoint. And they cover a variety of cases, too. Mm-hmm. It's not just white women. And they cover, sometimes they're not even, like, murders. Sometimes they're, like... I like heists. Heists are fun. They had one really good heist episode. It <laughs> kind of reminded me of... Um, that movie, who was in it now? Not Ocean's Eleven, but it was a similar one. Seth Green was in it. <laughs> oh, what was it called? The Italian Job. Mm. It sort of reminded me a little bit of that, but it was really interesting and a lot of fun. See, that's the thing. I think you can cover crimes that aren't, you know, 
John Wayne Casey. Yeah. And it can still be interesting. And they... And you learn things. They um, donate a lot of money to causes, and they're advocates for, like, marginalized people, like, especially, mm-hmm. like, LGBTQ um, issues and things like that. Um, so I think that they might find this a little bit insulting. I don't know. But... I don't know them well enough to say. Yeah. I like, do they make a, actually listen to any of my favorite murders. Do they make a lot of money off their podcast? I'm pretty sure they do. Do they have merch? Yeah, absolutely. But if that's what people want, like, just because you have merch doesn't mean that you're unethical in your reporting of true crime, I wouldn't say. But... Put it this way. I don't think you can paint everything with the same brush and go, all true crime is good or all true crime is no. bad. I think there is a place for true crime. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point she says the, where's that here? Uh, studies of true crime have found that white women are the largest demographic that enjoyed the true crime genre. The hypothesis is that because women in particular have anxiety about potential threats and they turn to true crime to feel better prepared if something violent were to happen to them. Nope. I think that is a valid point. That's not why I listen to true crime. It is, it's not the main reason why I listen to true crime. I listen because I find the psychology aspect of it fascinating. Mm-hmm. But it is one of those things where every once in a while you go, do you want I'm going to remember that? <laughs> <laughs> That's handy dandy tips and tricks. <laughs> Even just, you pick up on behavior mm-hmm. that's a bit more of like, oh, that's a red flag. I guess that's true. You you pick up things like that subconsciously without necessarily realizing it. So I think there is a place for it. Yeah. I do not doubt for a second that some people go about it all wrong mm-hmm. and completely unethical and in a way that's just kind of glorifying the murders. Yeah. Like, no. But I'm also a big advocate for you can't hide the messy parts of society. No. You can't hide the fact that our police system and our justice system is corrupt and broken. You can't hide the fact that our prisons are overcrowded and underfunded mm-hmm. and the fact that schools cost a ridiculous amount of money and that the cards are stacked against you irregardless, Mm -hmm. especially more so if you're from a marginalized community. The history, like the residential schools, you can't hide from that. You can't Mm -hmm. hide from slavery. You can't hide from the horrible things that your country or your people have done. Yeah. I don't believe in putting or sweeping anything under the rug because one of the things that I feel is often overlooked with true crime is... They go into the history of John Wayne Gacy, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think there's merit in that. Because then you go, oh, (laughs) look, head trauma, parental Mm -hmm. abuse, alcohol. Turns out that's not a good combination. Let's stop doing that. And that's also, like, a common combination Mm -hmm. in true crime. Like, comes up often. It's pretty much consistent. Yep. Like, I think that awareness... The general public's awareness of mental health issues and red flags and, Mm -hmm. like, hey, um, your child happens to be murdering neighborhood pets therapy now. Like, now. Mm -hmm. Preferably yesterday already, but now. Yeah. Like, I think it does bring awareness to situations and issues that people can catch a lot earlier that hopefully will reduce the amount of serial killers over time, preferably. (laughs) Yeah. I think there's a lot of different ways that you can look at true crime Mm -hmm. and i know it's like oh you're just justifying it because you like it yes and no (laughs) (laughs) i know it does seem to have suddenly blown up in the last like five years though Mm -hmm. also so i I don't know it's one of those things that i think it needs to be done correctly Mm -hmm. and with with sensitivity yeah and not any old joe blow can start a true crime podcast yeah like, like, for example, the Murdoch murders. I know you started it. It's a very dense, uh, detail-oriented podcast. Mm-hmm. But its main focus was sort of exposing the old boys club in South Carolina. And in particular, the Murdoch family. Those of you who know True Crime are probably very familiar with this case. It's very recent. Um, but they go really in-depth into, like, let's look at the corruption. Let's look at, like, these people were treated unfairly because of this. Or this guy got off because he's a rich white boy. And, you know, he raped three girls but didn't have to go to jail for it. And things like that. Which I think is really important 
to, yeah, let's expose some of this corruption. Let's expose some of this stuff that's happening where people are getting treated unfairly and Mm -hmm. people are getting away with things they should not be getting away with because... And to a point also, know your rights. Yeah. Like, and yeah. after listening to true crime, I'm like, well, I know my rights a little bit better. Yeah. Step one, get a lawyer. Yeah, I don't exactly. care if you're innocent, get a lawyer. And so, yeah, like, these people are both journalists, and so had been working on this for a while, and then decided to start a podcast, and it's, like, once the case, the Alex Murdoch case ended, I haven't listened quite as regularly, but um, up until his conviction, I listened to every episode. So, yeah, but it's, there's a lot, there's a lot there. And it's it's insane to me how some of this stuff can be happening. You, like, you're supposed to trust the justice system, and it's supposed to work in your favor, right? But it, it really doesn't. No. No. Not at doesn't. all. No. There's a reason why I will harp till the end of the world. Get a lawyer. <laughs> I do not care if you are innocent. I do not care if you are guilty. Yeah. Get a lawyer. So. Preferably a good one. But, uh, but yeah, it's just... And never admit to crimes. <laughs> well, I mean, admit to crimes if you know you're a terrible person that murders people, but... Well, if you know you're going down for it anyways, it's probably better if you say... You can probably cut a better deal if you admit to it. Yes. I don't know. But I know nothing about that world, really. But True crime is one of those things that I understand why people don't like it, and I understand why people do like mm-hmm. it. I think there's definitely the, the glorifying of the, the murders. I mean, everybody knows Ted Bundy who knows his victims. Yeah. Like, I get it. There's a lot. There's mm-hmm. a lot of names to remember. Mm-hmm. But that's the point. Yeah. Like, and I think it also brings up cases for the death penalty. And I shouldn't say bring up cases. It brings up conversation around the death penalty, which I think is something we need to be having. Anyways, I just thought this article was interesting because as somebody who enjoys and listens to a lot of true crime, I never really thought about the ethical side of it really that there was an ethical side of it really and uh well i don't know like i guess i probably thought well should this be entertainment and i know like my favorite murder got a lot of flack because they make a lot of jokes Mm -hmm. but their reasoning is that it's their way of dealing with heavy topics right yes and uh but there's also a point where you're throwing yourself at the heavy topics the heavy topics aren't coming to you yeah they, they build themselves as a true crime comedy podcast. So anyways, that's neither here nor there. It's just, it was an interesting perspective. And I chose this article before I started reading the book. And then the book actually touched on <laughs> the ethics of true crime. So I thought that was sort of... I mean, I will say, Harley... Harley? Harley Granger. Yeah. Um, he's horrible. Yeah. He is the worst example of true crime and sensationalism and yellow journalism. So I don't like him. Oh. Nope. He can go away. <laughs> As can this book. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I really didn't like it at all. I had such hope after the second half. Like, I honestly, know. I'm like, oh, it could be good. It could be good. Yeah. Like, I don't think it was ever going to blow my mind. But I'm like, there's potential. Yeah. It could be. It could. No, it's not. No. And. No. It's just too bad. I don't like it when I'm disappointed by this kind of book. Mm-hmm. Like. <sighs> I don't want to go like, you could do the crime so much better. Here, I'll show you. (laughs) That's just horrible. But there's some things where I'm like, really? That's your villain? Like, yeah. well, I do not like, you do have some level of respect for good villains. I'm not talking serial killers. No, obviously not. But like a good Bond villain where you kind of go, oh, yes, Mr. Bond. Like, you kind of like the villains because some of them are just fun and if i had to pick a character to play whether i be superman or a villain villain every time <laughs> generally they come with capes just say and better outfits <laughs> i like a good villain he is pathetic he is useless he is incompetent he is a sorry excuse for a villain the only redeeming thing is if he does actually have seasonal masks <laughs> Well, I do not agree with the use of the masks. I I could appreciate the fact that... I mean, I really, really hope that it's the one part that Evan let him pick and he just went all out with it. It's a good shtick. I I mean, if there's not a sequel that has that in there or a director's cut, you nearly really need to do it, Lisa. Like, honestly, it would make it so much better. If you ever want me to consult, let me know. (laughs) On that note, I don't know what more we could say about this book. Uh, I'm going to get sued one day, aren't I? <laughs> Better I you than me. There's just some books where it's just like, just just let me fix it, please. 
I mean, I would then read that book and go, no, 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 that's worse. But, you know, <laughs> it's the thought that counts, right? Sure. So that's what we thought of the book, but those are just our opinions, and we'd like to hear yours. Leave us a comment. Thanks for joining us for Books and Banter, and thanks to our editor, Linda. We'll see you next time.